Welcome to Getting a Grasp on Multimodal Single-Cell Omics Data, In-Depth Comparison Between Multi-Omics Cytometry and Traditional Cytometric Methods, presented by BioCompare and sponsored by 10X Genomics. My name is Tamlin Oliver, Managing Editor of BioCompare, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. Today, Hans Wills from Janssen will talk about the benefits and features of multiple cytometry techniques and also discuss a study that looked at the concordance among several different technologies. He'll get started shortly, but first we want to go over a few housekeeping items. We'll hold a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question for the Q&A session at any time using the Ask a Question tab in the upper right corner of your screen. The right side of the screen also features an overview of the webinar as well as more information on the speaker. In addition, your console is fully customizable and we encourage you to move, maximize, or minimize any of the tools on your screen to optimize your viewing experience. If you have technical difficulties at any time, click on the Test Your Connection button at the bottom of your screen. From there, you can access webinar support. We have also provided social media widgets beneath the webinar window to facilitate the sharing of this webinar with colleagues. All right, with all that done, I can properly introduce our speaker and we can get this webinar underway. Hans Wills is a senior scientist in the Computational Sciences Department at Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson. He's focused on the development and implementation of novel single cell sequencing te technologies. Prior to joining Janssen, he was a technology research manager at MultipleCom, now part of Agilent, and assay development manager at Histogenics. He obtained his PhD in biochemistry and biotechnology at the University of Antwerp. Welcome, Hans. We're ready for your presentation now. Take it away. So, yes, uh, hello, good morning, good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tamlin. So, before we start, let me first thank you and the people from BioCompare for providing us an opportunity to present some of the work that we did with Jan within Jansa on establishing this novel high-dimensional and multimodal single-cell sequencing technology platform that is termed multi-omic cytometry. So quickly introducing myself here, I'm a scientist with an interest in single-cell sequencing technologies, and I work within the Janssen Discovery Sciences Computational Sciences team, which is a global team spread across the United States and Europe, where I myself, I am located in Belgium. So I assume most of you will know Janssen Pharmaceuticals already as being part of Johnson & Johnson, one of the major healthcare companies in the world. Um, here at Janssen, we focus our efforts and resources where the need is high, the science is compelling, and where we have the greatest opportunity to save and improve lives. There are actually six therapeutic areas that we focus on in Janssen which are cardiovascular and metabolism, uh, immunology, infectious diseases and vaccines, which is uh, even more relevant these last months, and also neuroscience, oncology, and pulmonary hypertension. So whenever scientists from these therapeutic areas come to us in discovery sciences with a research question on studying and characterizing samples at a single cell level, such as, for instance, patient-derived PBMCs or peripheral blood mononuclear cell samples to study the immune system, there are a couple of high-dimensional uh, platforms available. There is the well-established flow cytometry platform that uses antibodies which are labeled with a fluorescent marker. And for this study, we have used a Cytoflex instrument. Secondly, we also have a mass cytometry or Cytof instrument available at our campus where antibody detection is based on measuring specific mass isotopes. And thirdly, we have since a couple of years also some single cell sequencing platforms available, of which the 10 Genomics Chromium platform is one of the more frequently used ones. As the name says, the readout of these latter technologies is based on sequencing data. And originally, they were mainly used to study the transcriptome or gene expression levels at the single cell level, but recently, these types of platforms have also become compatible with, for instance, simultaneously measuring surface marker expression by using antibodies that are barcoded with a specific nucleotide sequence. So looking at the number of cells that can be processed, it is clear that this is currently much higher for the flow and site of workflows, which are capable of analyzing up to millions of cells, while for multi-omic cytometry, this is currently typically in the tens of thousands of cell range. Looking, however, at the number of antibodies or parameters that can be analyzed in one experiment, this maxes out to about, let's say, 20 for flow and uh, 50 for mass cytometry, 
while for the multi-omic cytometry platform, there is no theoretical limit, as there are probably more barcode sequences possible than that there are antibodies available. Uh, although we haven't gone up ourselves yet that high, other studies that we know of and that are being conducted in the scientific community are currently using up to 300 antibodies simultaneously. So the multi-omic cytometry workflow is currently clearly more an exploratory platform, while flow and mass cytometry are more focused on higher throughput. For those that may not yet be familiar with the single cell sequencing technology platform, I will briefly explain the workflow here. So the chromium platform works via microfluidic partitioning to capture single cells and prepare barcoded cDNA libraries for sequencing. Specifically, single cells, reverse transcription reagents, gel beads containing barcoded oligonucleotides and oil are all combined on a microfluidic chip to form reaction vesicles, which are called gel beads in emulsion or gems. And these gems are formed in parallel within the microfluidic channels of the chip thus allowing to process up to 10,000 single cells in one channel. There are eight of these microfluidic channels available on each chip, and before the single cells are loaded onto the chip, they are incubated in the case of a multi-omic cytometry workflow with barcoded antibodies, allowing the antibodies to bind to their specific surface mark, which is a step that is very similar to flow and mass cytometry workflows. Within each functional reaction vesicle, or so-called gem, that contains a single cell with bound antibodies, then the single cell is sliced. The gel bead is dissolved to free up the identically barcoded reverse transcription oligonucleotides into solution, and reverse transcription of polyadenylated mRNA and barcoded antibodies occur. As a result, all antibodies and cDNA from a single cell will have the same gem or cell barcode, allowing the sequencing reads to be mapped back to their single cell of origin. The preparation of sequencing libraries from these barcoded cDNAs and antibodies is then further carried out in a bulk reaction, where the antibody sequencing library is separated from the RNA expression library during one of the purification steps. Um, it is important to note that in this study, we have used the 5' prime or VDJ immune prof profiling kit, where barcoded total CXC antibodies from BioLegend need to be used for compatibility with this type of chemistry. But by using this assay, we also have the ability to retrieve paired T-cell receptor and B-cell receptor information, which I will also come back to a bit later in the presentation. Combining the single cell RNA sequencing technology with these nucleotide barcoded antibodies was first described at the end of 2017 in two independent papers where this type of workflow was either termed sitesec for uh, cellular indexing of transcriptomes and epitopes by sequencing, or RIPSeq for RNA expression and protein sequencing. So looking at the experimental design of the study, our aim was to assess the concordance between multi-omic cytometry and flow and mass cytometry workflows, as it was important for us to understand how this novel platform relates to the data that is generated with the two already established platforms. Thus, we analyzed PBMC samples from two healthy volunteers on flow with a 14 antibody immune panel and on site of with two 37 antibody panels, of which one is more T-cell focused and the other more antigen presenting cell or APC focused. For the multi-omic cytometry part, we performed a first experiment with 14 antibodies directed against the same markers as the flow panel, and a second experiment with 62 antibodies directed against the combined markers of the site of panel. To then assess concordance across all three cytometry platforms, 10 of the 14 antibodies present in all panels were utilized to calculate and compare the cell population frequencies of 10 immune cell populations as shown here in this figure. Additionally, we performed a more in-depth comparison for the mass and multi-omic cytometry platforms where the frequency of 22 immune cell populations was assessed based on an extended number of antibodies available in the panels. So, this slide provides an overview of how the data were processed. For flow and mass cytometry, raw counts were convert, converted in cytobank to filtered cell counts, followed by manual gating to annotate the different cell populations. For the 10x multi-omic cytometry gene expression data processing, uh, cell ranger was used to do the filtering from raw expression count matrices. Next, either SURAT or ScanPy packages were used to cluster the data, and finally, 
The singular package was used to annotate these clusters. For the data processing of the antibodies, which are referred to as feature barcodes by 10x, we either used the cell ranger or an in-house developed pipeline to convert the raw count matrices to filtered ones, and finally also annotated the cell populations by manual gating in cytobank. Now, before we start looking into the concordance among the cytometry platforms, we first wanted to also investigate the reproducibility of the multi-omic cytometry platform, as we also needed to generate multiple replicates of each sample to increase the number of cells processed and analyzed. Therefore, high reproducibility is crucial to be able to pull these replicates, and, is already, and as already said before, each 10x genomics microfluidic chip has eight separate reaction channels that can be run simultaneously. Thus, uh, we set up two individual experiments, starting from PBMC samples of two healthy volunteers to assess both intra and interchip reproducibility within each donor. In experiment one, four reaction channels were loaded with cells without any antibodies added, whereas the other four reaction channels contained cells that were incubated with the same 14 antibody markers, which were also used in the flow panel. This setup actually allowed us to assess the effect of adding barcoded antibodies to the gene expression readout. In the second experiment, which was carried out almost a year later, as at the time this technology was pretty novel and we had to await total 6C antibody availability for all markers, we loaded two full chips with all replicates containing the 62 antibody panel that overlaps with the markers used in the site of T-cell and APC panel. Furthermore, we also determined T-cell receptor sequences for each reaction, as well as B-cell receptor sequences in experiment two. So let's first take a look at some of the quality control metrics of the gene expression data. After filtering raw sequencing data with the cell ranger pipeline using their empty drops method, which is essentially a cell calling algorithm that allows retaining only the information of what are considered high quality or true cells. For each uh, sample, we visualized here some important quality parameters, such as the number of genes for each cell, the number of UMIs or unique, unique molecular identifiers per cell, which provides information on the number of unique transcripts retrieved for each cell, and also the percentage of mitochondrial reads, which is generally accepted as an indicator for how healthy or viable a specific cell is. It is important to note here that this filtering step is at the moment standardly based on the quality of the gene expression information that is retrieved for each cell. We will come back on this towards the end of the presentation, where we will discuss that this selection of high quality cells could now also be based on antibody quality information in the multi-omic cytometry workflow. But for the next slides, we continued uh, the analysis with the filtered cells that were retained by the standard cell ranger pipeline. Finally, you can also immediately observe that two of the replicate samples clearly have a different, different pattern as highlighted in the red squares. And this was actually due to the gem or functional droplet generation issue that uh, occurred during the wet lab procedure. Therefore, these two replicates were excluded from further analysis. When we then look at the estimated number of cells that are retrieved for each replicate, we find an average of, let's say, about 4,000 cells where we targeted about 5,000 cells to be retrieved, with some higher variation, especially between the replicates with and without antibodies of donor one in experiment one, as uh, seen in the left. Here it is important to understand that the single cell partitioning workflow is highly dependent on accurate cell counting. And we suspect here that more cells were loaded for the higher rep uh, replicates due to suboptimal counting of the number of input cells. However, if you look at the median number of genes that are detected for each sample, this is very similar across all samples at around 1,500 genes per cell. So as you may remember, the first experiment was set up with replicates that either did or did not have antibodies added to investigate if there was a potential effect on the gene expression profiles caused by antibody incubation steps. For visualizing the result of these questions, we showed here a UMAP visualization plot, which is essentially an often used dimensionality reduction tool, where each dot in this view represents one cell and where cells are clustered based on their similarity in gene expression profiles. You can nicely appreciate that for each condition in each donor, a similar proportion of cells seems to be occupying each cluster, 
indicating that there is a very little to no effect on the gene expression by adding antibodies to the workflow. Probably also important to mention here is that no specific integration algorithms were used for clustering these replicates together. In the next slide, we use the UMAP visualization tool to show that also for the second experiment, we see that for each condition and each donor, a similar number of cells is occupying each cluster, again, indicating that there is a very good reproducibility across the replicates and also between chips in this case. Again, no integration methods were used here. However, if we generate a UMAP for all the samples across the two experiments, we can clearly observe some batch effects in the sense that some clusters, for instance, the green cluster in the left ochre plot, is almost exclusively consisting of cells that originate from experiment one. For further analysis, these types of batch effects can be rescued by batch correction algorithms, such as, for instance, Harmony in this example, which are useful algorithms if you are to analyze a high number of samples that need to be processed across several batches. I would also like to note here that, as already mentioned, the two experiments were conducted almost one year apart from each other, with also some modifications in the respective workflows due to updated Tenix protocols, which are likely also explaining at least part of the batch variation that is observed between both experiments. Okay, so all of these previous slides were actually focused on reproducibility of the RNA gene expression information. So now let's put our attention to the antibody or feature barcode information that is retrieved in the multi-omic cytometry workflow. First, uh, I would like to start with showing you this metric of the median number of reads that were retrieved for the antibodies or feature barcodes per cell. As you can see, this number ranged for these experiments between 2,000 and uh, 4,000 informative informative reads per cell, which represent the total reads for 14 antibodies in the first experiment and 62 antibodies in the second experiment. It is, of course, possible to sequence deeper for each antibody library to obtain more informative reads, but this obviously also comes at a certain cost. So you will want to optimize each antibody concentration so that each antibody is well represented within the total number of reads, and ideally with more abundant markers taking up a slightly higher fraction of the reads than the less abundant markers. Here you can see the distribution of the antibody reads that were obtained for the first experiment with the 14 antibody panel, with on the left a color scale for all antibodies, and on the right the same pie chart with some markers highlighted for easier interpretation. So all antibodies were added at the same concentration of 0.1 microgram per test. And it is immediately clear that some markers are taking up a large, large percentage of the total reads, such as, for instance, CD45 RA in blue and CD16 in green. On the other hand, some markers such as CD8 in yellow would probably have benefited from a slightly higher concentration to take up relatively more reads. Here is the distribution for the 62 antibody panel from experiment two where the antibodies were added at varying concentrations that were mostly based on advised concentration ranges by BioLegend for each antibody. So as you can appreciate, adding more antibodies also makes it more challenging to make sure that each antibody is well represented. In this case, for instance, HLADR in red is taking up a large portion of the reads, while for instance, CD8 in yellow, again, only represents a very small portion of the total obtained reads. I hope you are even able to see the yellow CD8 fraction here uh, on the slides, which is just below the HLADR fraction. Thus, the message here is that to reduce costs associated with sequencing, it is quite important that your panel is optimally balanced to sufficiently represent each marker. Luckily, uh, when we look at the individual antibody counts, we can still observe a bimodal distribution pattern for most antibodies, including, for instance, CD8. And after normalizing these antibody counts with an arcsine transformation, which is a function commonly used in Cytobank for also transforming Cytov data, we can observe quite a similar distribution pattern across both technologies for most markers. A comparable CLR or centered log ratio transformation of antibody data was also described in the original SiteSeq paper. And these results indicate to us that the antibody feature barcode signals can also be used to further determine cell populations. So going back to the question of how reproducible antibody signals are picked up across replicates, here is a heat map for the observed frequencies of the 10 more general immune cell populations of the different replicates in experiment one. 
with uh, donor two shown on the left and donor one shown on the right here. And as you can see, there seems to be quite a high consistency between the replicates in each donor. Similarly, high consistency is also observed for the replicates in experiment two, where, as you may remember, replicates were also loaded across two different microfluidic chips. So now that we have established that both the gene expression and the feature barcode antibody information are highly consistent across replicates, at least with the same, within the same experiment, we can merge the data from the replicates in the same experiment and treat them as one combined sample that contains a higher number of cells captured. In these plots from experiment two data, you can appreciate the added value of having antibody information complementary to the gene expression information. What you can, for instance, observe is that it is not so easy from the gene expression information alone in the bottom panel to identify CD4 positive cells, while this becomes much more apparent from the antibody data, especially when you overlay the CD3 information to help you identify the T cell cluster. Also, thanks to the feature barcode antibody data, it becomes now possible to distinguish, for instance, between CD45RA and RO for naive and memory markers, while this was not evident just based on transcriptome information. Coming then to the actual comparison between the different cytometry platforms, here is again a brief overview of how we went out to assess the concordance. So for the 14 antibody panel, we looked at the frequency of 10 more general immune cell populations across flow, CYTOF and 10X genomics gene expression and antibody feature barcode signals. For the more extended antibody panel, we looked into the frequencies of 22 immune cell populations obtained in CYTOF versus 10X gene expression and antibody feature barcode information. Here are the data that we obtained for the first donor at the level of the 10 immune cell populations. And as already indicated before, and as can also be observed in this heat map, there was unfortunately considerable heterogeneity between the PBMC aliquots used in the two experiments, with, for instance, a higher fraction of monocytes consistently observed in the PBMC aliquots used in experiment one versus the aliquots used in experiment two. Therefore, uh, we decided to assess concordance among the technologies within the same experiment, meaning that flow data was compared with experiment one multi-omic cytometry data, and site of data was compared with experiment two multi-omic cytometry results. The right upper plot shows the comparison for experiment one, where we observe a Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.85 between flow and antibody feature barcode data, while this was as high as 0.98 for the comparison between site of and feature barcode information in experiment two. It is probably also worth mentioning here that we were able to, uh, for experiment two to generate the site of and multi-omic cytometry on one and the same PBMC aliquot, while for the experiment one, we had to use separate aliquots for flow and multi-omic cytometry, probably also explaining the higher concordance observed in experiment two. We also plotted the correlation with the gene expression data, and this was calculated as mentioned before, based on cell annotations using the singular cell annotation tool. Similarly, we show here in the next slide the same comparisons for donor two, where we again find quite high Pearson correlation coefficients between antibody feature barcodes, data, and either flow or site of, while in this case, the correlation with the singular gene expression cell annotation is consistently a bit lower, which seems to be mainly driven by an overestimation of the CD4 naive cell population and an underestimation of the CD4 memory population. Again, this may not be so surprising as we have already seen from previous slides that the RNA transcript information does not allow to discriminate between uh, CD45 RA and RO status. Okay, now here are the observed frequencies for the extended 22 immune cell populations in donor one from experiment two replicates, where we compared again site of results with antibody feature barcode and gene expression annotations both for feature barcode antibodies as well as gene expression information, we observed quite high Pearson correlation coefficients above 0 0.9. A very similar high correlation coefficient uh, was also retrieved for a donor two, leading us to the conclusion that there seems to be indeed a high concordance between multi-omic cytometry data and either flow or site of data that should allow for replicating antibody-based observations across cytometry platforms. 
So, as was already mentioned before as well, we utilized in this study the Tenix Genomics 5' immune profiling kit, which also allows you to obtain simultaneously the paired alpha-beta T-cell receptor sequences and the paired heavy and light chain B-cell receptor sequences. In this figure, we indicated for experiment two data on the upper left, all the cells that we were able to retrieve T-cell receptor information from, and on the lower left, all the cells where we were able to retrieve B-cell receptor information from. Uh, on the right, you can see the results of the clustering for all cells in the sample, where clustering was done on gene expression information with cell type annotation or coloring based on feature barcode antibody information. And it is clear that the cells with either TCR or BCR sequences are overlapping with the respective T-cell or B-cell annotated um, cell clusters. When we briefly drill down on, on the T-cell cluster, you can see that for the majority of the T-cells where we could not identify the receptor information as mostly confined to the cells where, within the indicated circle, these cells seem to be of lower quality in the sense that they clearly have a higher percentage of mitochondrial reads and lower gene and UMI or transcript counts. Now, when we tried to assign immune T-cell subset populations on this same T-cell cluster, we observed quite some differences in the cell type assignment when we did the annotation either based on feature barcode antibody information, as shown on the left, or singular Monaco gene expression uh, based annotation, as shown on the right. While it is definitely true that most of our knowledge on immune cells is based on protein surface marker information, and high-quality gene expression-based uh, marker sets still need to be developed for several immune cell subsets. I think this comparison plot also indicates that within certain immune subsets that are, current, that are currently classified as being the same cell type based on surface markers, there is also still considerable heterogeneity observed on the gene expression level, which could prove to be biologically relevant. For sure, this would be an important follow-up in future experiments to better, better understand the relation between antibody-based and gene expression-based cell annotation in immune cell subsets. Okay, shifting gears a little bit for this last section of the presentation, I would like to sh shortly touch upon the question if what we call high quality or true cells in multi-omic cytometry can also be determined and hopefully even improved based on antibody information instead of only gene expression QC metrics, which was the case for all of the previous data that I showed. So what we did here for the samples generated in experiment two is try to determine the overlap of cells that are selected to be high quality or true cells based on either their gene expression metrics as processed by the standard Tenex Genomics Cell Ranger pipeline or cells determined by the novel Cell Ranger uh, feature barcoding only analysis pipeline that is available since Cell Ranger version 3.1 and only uses antibody information to determine high quality cells versus as a third tool, which is our in house developed cell detection pipeline. First, briefly explaining how our in house developed pipeline works. Um, Raw feature barcode antibody count matrices were transformed with an arc sign transformation and plotted on a knee plot with on the X axis the transformed antibody counts and on the Y axis all the potential cell barcodes. An automated cutoff was then implemented also based on the knee inflection point, selecting only the cell barcodes to the right of the cutoff and resulting in the filtered feature barcode matrices that were further used to annotate cell populations by manual gating in Cytobank. We also implemented another QC step where we looked for each sample at the CD45 RA and RO signals, as these should normally be mutually exclusive. As you can see, for samples where we observed a clear knee on the plots, we also find a nice separation between the CD45 RA and RO signal, while for the two samples where we could not find a clear knee, as shown on the right, also, the CD45 RA RO signal is not well separated. Incidentally, the two samples that failed here are also the ones that were excluded based on their gene expression metrics before due to failure in the gem or functional droplet generation. So here are the, are the results for the two donors, where for each true cell detection method, we plotted the number of cells and their percentages upon the total, with also a blue coloring scale 
to provide a visual indication of the percentage of cells retrieved for each Venn diagram section. It is in interesting to observe here, I think, that um, there are actually quite a lot of cells that are selected by the antibody-based method outside of the cells determined by gene expression alone. And there's only 40 to 50% of the cells that are found in common between the three technologies, depending on the donor. Also, a significant overlap was observed between the gene expression cell ranger pipeline and our in-house cell detection methods. While this was not really picked up by the current version of the cell ranger feature barcoding antibody only pipeline. To determine if we could further improve the concordance among site of and multi omic cytometry data, we thus decided to compare the site of data with either the union of the cells picked up with the cell ranger gene expression and our in house cell detection mod methods, or the union of the cell ranger gene expression and cell ranger feature barcoding only pipeline. In this slide, you can see that for donor one, adding these additional cells does not really improve the concordance with site of results for either of the two pipelines, and even shows a bit lower correlation for the 10 immune cell populations. Although the selection of high quality cells based on the union of gene expression and our in-house developed pipeline seems to maintain the higher concordance. Similar results are also found for donor two, with again the union of the cell ranger gene expression and our in-house developed pipeline maintaining a higher concordance, but again, not better than when we look at cells selected based on gene expression alone. So although at first glance, it does not really seem to be so beneficial to do this additional selection of cells on PBMC samples, aside from the fact that you will have more cells to analyze, we have learned from other studies that this approach could be very valuable when looking, for instance, at whole blood samples, where there is a high chance that, for instance, granulocytes will be filtered out of the multi-omic data with the standard cell range pipeline due to low gene expression metrics, which can then be rescued by an antibody-based cell detection pipeline. So as a summary, uh, we find that the multi-omic cytometry platform is a reproducible technology that can be used as an exploratory tool for analyzing a high number of surface markers, which can afterwards be further validated and on other uh, higher throughput platforms, such, such as flow and mass cytometry with more focused panels. Additionally, the multi-omic cytometry workflow allows for simultaneous multimodal information, including RNA gene expression, and for instance, T cell and B cell receptor information. We have also shown that adding antibodies does not seem to negatively impact the gene expression profiles, at least for the 10x5 prime immune profiling assay in combination with total 6C antibodies, but that it is important to make sure that your antibody panel is optimized in the sense that you want to make sure that all antibody markers are represented well in the total panel to minimize the total sequencing costs. Uh, as a final note, it is also important to realize that currently the 10 multi-omic cytometry workflow is only support, supported for analyzing surface markers, although people are working hard to make this technology also compatible with intracellular markers, hopefully somewhere in the near future. Great, so the results that I showed here today actually involve the efforts of several of my colleagues in Janssa spread across different departments. Within our Belgium-based computational sciences team led by Henry Gilman, uh, several people from the team of Joker Römers were, invo were involved. This uh, team is mainly focused on the analysis of single cell data. And here I would like to thank, especially together with Joker, also Dries and Kuhn for doing the heavy lifting for all of the analysis. I myself, I'm a member in the team of Jeroen van Hout and we are more focused on the wet lab implementation of these novel single cell technologies. Uh, additionally, I would also like to thank Greta and Tina for the, from the Molecular and Cellular Pharmacology Department for running the site of samples and the Immunology Discovery Team with Nathan, Ryan and Frederick for running the flow experiments and also being involved in the setup of the multi-omic experiments. Besides that, we are also thankful for the support uh, from Beth from the Janssen Innovation Team and Trishanta from Open Analytics. And finally, I would also like to thank Tenex Genomics and BioLegend for their support in this collaborative study. So I have also invited my colleague Joke here to attend the Q&A session as well, to answer any questions that might come up related to the different analyses and bioinformatic pipelines that were used. And with that, I would like to close off this presentation by thanking all of you for listening. 
And uh, Jok and I will be happy to try and address any questions that may have come up during the talk. Thanks, Hans, for that very informative presentation. We have a number of audience questions already, so we're going to jump right into that. I just want to remind you that you can continue to submit questions for Hans or for Yoka at any time using the Q&A box on your screen. All right, Hans, you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Okay. The first question is, does multi-omic cytometry work for intracellular proteins? Um, so uh, that's a good question. So at the moment, it is not. So it's only working for surface markers. But people are working hard to also make this work for uh, intracellular markers. Uh, the thing is that uh, so when you're doing multi-omic cytometry, you're also looking at uh, the RNA information. So people are looking now into fixation protocols that will also keep your uh, RNA quality to be able to get both that RNA um, readout as well as the uh, uh, protein uh, readouts. So this is definitely something that we are also waiting for and that's hopefully available in, in the near future. All right, here's the next question. What is the advantage of five prime sequencing compared to three prime sequencing? So the three prime sequencing is, is one of the more general used methods, while the five prime sequencing is specifically developed for um, the immune profiling. So uh, to obtain information of your uh, B cell receptor or your T cell receptors, uh, you need the variable um, regions, and, and those are, are five prime located on, on your uh, genes. So um, with this technology, you can, you can read your full sequence, and this is, of course, uh, important if you're interested in looking at uh, the immune repertoire to look at uh, clonal expansions, for instance, of uh, B cells or T cells. Okay, the next question is a multi-part one. Um, you have shown a bimodal distribution for the antibody signal. Is that distribution for only the cells that passed QT or QC in cell waiver ranger? And how is the distribution overall? Is that signal above the signal of the droplets with intermediate UMI gene expression content? Okay, so. Um, for the um, bimodal distribution, in, indeed, in the slides, this was only done after uh, selection of, of cells based uh, on, on the cell ranger pipeline. But from the last part of the presentation, uh, people might have seen that it is indeed possible to pick up um, more cells if we only look with the feature barcode pipeline, uh, so that we ob observe signals there. But for the vast majority of the uh, what is termed yeah, non-cells non or, or which are ignored by cell ranger, we effectively don't really pick up uh, um, feature barcode UMI signals. Okay, let me pull up your next question. Uh, what are the advantages of feature barcoding compared to index sorting? Okay, so that's, that's also a good question. Um, you can actually combine uh, index sorting with, with feature barcoding. The advantage is that you will have with your feature barcoding, you will have that information as well in during your readout. Uh, let's say, for instance, um, you can do your CD45 RA row. If you, you're interested in both those fractions, you can immediately see that from the feature barcoding. While with the index sorting, if you're sorting for multiple markers, you're solely dependent on the transcriptome information if if you don't add the antibodies uh, in the in the mix there. So, um, but it can be combined with index sorting as well. The only important note that I would say there is that um, it's probably important to use different markers for the index sorting and the multi-omic cytometry. So I wouldn't, or at least we haven't tried to to use the same clones both for fluorescent and markers uh, and then also for uh, multi-omic cytometry um, as probably um, your surface markers will then be um, splitted across the fluorescent and the barcoded antibodies. So that's something um, you should, I think, either optimize or try to avoid this by using different epitopes for the, for the same marker. That's also a possibility that you can look into. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, based on this cell surface markers data from RNA and protein, can we have generalized observations that which surface markers are good for looking from 10x RNA? In other words, which cell surface markers are optimal to find and identify cell type using 10x RNA? So I, I think the, the question is, is asking which 
overlap there is between the RNA uh, information and, and the gene expression information. So there are definitely so, some markers that show good overlap. There's, for instance, uh, the CD3 and the CD8 that you might have seen that show very similar patterns between the CD uh, bit, uh, cross RNA expression and antibody information. But there's other markers like, for instance, the CD4 that uh, in our experiments at least seem to be um, much better working on the antibody level while on the, on the transcript, transcript level, this is uh, much less um, easy to discern which cells are CD4 positive or not. So I hope, I hope this answers this question. All right, uh, I wanna say that we have a lot of questions coming in, so thank you very much for submitting them. And Hans, uh, thank you for answering all these questions. So we'll keep going uh, until we You're are welcome. up to the hour. The next question is, Treg seem better identified by GEX. Do you have any idea where the differences came? That's, I don't know, that's, that's uh, maybe a difficult one because I guess this also depends on, on the annotation. Uh, so for the feature barcoding, we have used or we have based our uh, calculations on CD25 and CD127, if I'm not mistaken. So we have seen, for, uh, and you might have also seen this in the presentation, that there were not really bimodal distribution patterns for these antibodies. So that might maybe um, explain uh, at least partially why the um, gene expression gene expression seems to be working better, although I'm not sure about, about this either. So that would really be something that we would have to look into detail, I think. Okay, uh, next question is, how did you titrate the total seek antibodies? Okay, um, so good question. And um, I, I tried to make this point in, in the presentation. So this is really something that I think is very important um, to titrate your um, your panel optimally. And so for this cocktail or panel, we have based ourselves on the um, guidelines of, of BioLegend. So they have some ranges where where you should uh, titrate your antibodies. But as you have seen, it's it's not always that easy because you distribute your reads across your um, total uh, sequencing reads. So I know that by now BioLegend has some pre-titrated antibody uh, panels available. But if you really have your own panel that you want to develop, I, I think the only way for now is to do some pilot experiments and try to um, optimize your concentrations based on the guidelines that are uh, also uh, provided by BioLegend if you, you ask for them. I think that's the best uh, way to go about for now. Okay, uh, the next question is, does 10X single cell sequencing work for immune infiltrating cells in other tissues except spleen and blood cells? So essentially 10, 10X genomics or the single cell sequencing workflow um, should work for any, any um, cells in suspension. So the tricky part is probably if you're going to work on, on organs that um, you have to develop um, an optimized um, dissociation protocol. Uh, which could influence or have a, have a large impact on, on your um, cell viability, for instance. So this would really require some some optimization from from the user's part if they're interested in in certain organs to to also do this on, on tenix genomics. But as long as the cells are um, are single and they are not too large, because I think the cutoff for using tenix genomics is around 50 microns, if I'm not mistaken, then um, the, the workflow should indeed work for other tissues as well. Okay, next question is, the quality of cells, would it work on frozen cells? For example, bone marrow aspirates, which have a lot of apoptotic cells, what percentage of apoptotic cells in the sample is acceptable and or not acceptable? Yeah, so uh, again, a good question. And um, I think um, what, what Tenex Genomics uh, advises is, is something like 80 to 90% viability. Of course, there's always the option, like I mentioned, that uh, you can do uh, sourcing uh, for viable cells. Um, so uh, it is actually, we have done tests like this uh, before. It is compatible with, with frozen bone marrow aspirates, the Tenex workflow. Uh, another workflow that we haven't tested is uh, dead cell removal um, kits based on beads. Um, so, but um, generally when we do this type of experiments, we go for 
um, viability sorting and then loading them on the next instrument. Okay, uh, you've shown Harmony integrated GEXP data. Do you see a batch effect when integrating the protein data from EXP1, uh, 14 AB, and EXP2, 20 AB? If so, how do you correct for this? So maybe that's that's a question. I don't know, Yoke, if you have some um, input on that, if we have compared those, I, I'm not aware. Uh, yeah, so yeah. we don't use I, we don't use Harmony uh, for batch correcting the antibodies simply because the panels are are extremely different. So the also the distribution between the antibodies, as you could see in the slide, is is quite diverse. But what we do is with the arc synergy transformation around the geometric mean, we normalize the signal of an antibody within its own distribution. So that's how we dealt with, with that variability. So we basically gate self into on off as you would do for a standard uh, site of our, our flow uh, phenotypic gating. Thanks, Joka, for weighing in on that one. Uh, all right, Hans, here's another one. Is multi-omic cytometry suitable for quantitative measurement of T-cell phenotypes and or biomarkers at a time? Okay, so let me see if I understand that question. Um, so the five prime workflow that we have used uh, allows allows for looking at the B cell receptor in uh, the T cell receptor information. But if you want to look at phenotypes uh, with the multiomic cytometry, there is first of all the the RNA expression level that you can look at, but also the antibody uh, the antibodies that you have added to your panel. But I'm not sure if I understand the link with the biomarker. I don't know, York. Maybe do you have some input on this? Uh, yeah. So I think for a biomarker, the limited amount of cells that you input uh, would be, I think, a bit a limiting factor. I think what we would do is uh, do discovery using the 10x and the side seek approach, but then probably implement a smaller panel in a flow or in a sites of experiment so that you can stably measure larger number of cells and also from a biomarker perspective that the assay itself is uh, reduced in cost. Okay, um, all right, the next question is, what method would you recommend to find rare populations lower than 1%? Yeah, so that, that's, that's also um, a good question. And um, so the, the limitation at the moment clearly is that that uh, the multi-omic cytometry only allows for uh, a couple of thousand up to ten thousands of of, uh, of cells. So um, if you want to look or find populations that are lower than than one percent, I, I think I honestly think that that one percent is is still um, feasible. If you if you can load ten thousand cells, for instance. Then you should you, you should still end up with let's say 100 cells, but uh, below that limit it becomes, of course, um, a bit more difficult to find uh, rare cell populations. Then if you have an idea uh, where, um, if you can do some pre-sorting via index sorting, for instance, if you're interested in a specific uh, T cell population, for instance, then that's uh, probably the way to go. But um, aside from that, currently that's still one of the limitations that you're uh, limited to the number of cells that you can input in the multi omic cytometry workflow indeed. You had mentioned earlier in the presentation that there was some issue with the data that you traced back to imp imperfect cell counting before loading cells into the chip. We've also experienced issues with the reliable cell counting. Do you have any suggestions on what methods you prefer for more accurate counts? Yeah, so so that's indeed a, also a good question, and and it's also something that uh, we have noticed as well that uh, your cell counting is is really crucial to uh, for the input of the of the tenx genomics. So what we have found is that actually manual counting seems to work the best for us. So, uh, but um, this is only or this will will only work well if you have a limited number of um, samples to load onto the the next instrument because you want to, of course, uh, limit the time that cells um, are um, 
yeah, before they are put on the system. So I would recommend if you're experienced with it in, in manual counting, that seems to work well for us. And otherwise, you would have to go with uh, with uh, automated counting. And, and therefore, it might suggest if you see some differences between your automated counting and manual counting to, and if these are consistent to somehow um, correct for these, if you use the automated cell counter, I would say to load on the 10X instrument. But this mm -hmm. is indeed a, a crucial um, crucial aspect of, of the loading on, on the Tenix instrument. Okay, thanks Hans. And uh, my questions are loading now, so I have three more questions and then we'll uh, call it a day. So uh, here's the next one. What can be done with AB barcoding when you need to discriminate between related immune populations that only have differences in marker expression levels and do not express unique markers? For example, differentiating between PMNs and granulocytic myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's that's a good, good question uh, indeed. And um, I uh, so I haven't been in this situation, but I, I guess... Um, there is, there have been some publications that um, the the multiomic cytometry or the workflow is uh, partially quantitative, so that you can look at um, at your um, intensity or, or your your number of reads. Uh, although we haven't uh, tested this ourselves, the other possibility I would say is that there are perhaps differences on the RNA expression level that. Um, can be seen into, so I, I'm not familiar with, with these cell types that are mentioned here, but maybe that is a possibility that there are differences on the uh, RNA level that are not uh, found on the protein level. I would suggest that, yeah. Uh, the next question is, can you explain the steps of your custom pipeline and what benefit does the ARXIN normalization of 10X single cell data provide compared to the basic CLR? I don't think that necessarily uh, the basic CLR would perform worse than the, the arc synage that we have used. We simply use it because it aligns more with the way we analyze site of data. And that gave us the opportunity to tap in a lot of the tools that we had already developed for, for site of also visualizations, et cetera. So I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily better. It was just more convenient because it allows us to, to, to tap into more tools. Um, and other than that, it's really a matter of doing the cell selection purely on the ADT data alone after doing the arc image transformation on the geometric mean. What we do see as a challenge there is, as Hans also showed in the presentation, if your ecomolar pooling of the antibodies is not optimal, um, the antibodies that receive the lower end of the UMIs, it would be tricky to uh, to use the, the bimodal setting there. So you would, like CD8, as Han showed, the, we did see a bimodal distribution there, but if we would have gotten even less UMI counts, it would have become tricky. So yeah, that's, um, I would say, that's that's our was our the way that we we use the data. The um, coming back to the, the earlier question on um, if you don't have a clear on off or a, a unique combination of markers, it would be quite similar to um, the distinction between phenotypic markers and functional markers and in flow and inside of so. We would indeed hope, as Hans mentioned, that we would be able to use the quantitative readout of the UMIs, but always within the antibody measurement itself. So it would depend heavily on the cell populations that are present within your sample. Okay, thanks, Yoka, for answering those questions. All right, the final question, Hans. Uh, have you noticed evaluated background signaling or background signal for protein data? If so, do you correct for them? Again, Joke, I don't know if you want to answer this uh, this one. If you, yeah, uh, so very different and from the gene expression data where you have really an off. Uh, I would say that after you do the cell selection, uh, we divided the antibodies into the one that had a clear bimodal pattern and then really labeled them as uh, on-off intermediates, like. Uh, 
uh, almost a binary assessment of the antibody signal. So that's how we so the we dealt with the background signal. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We want to thank Hans Wills for joining us today, as well as Yoko Rimmers, and a special thank you to 10x Genomics and Biologin for sponsoring today's event. This webinar will be available on demand in about 24 hours. You can watch it again or share it with colleagues by visiting biocompare.com. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event.